everyone, and thank you for joining the Nonprofit Learning Lab for today's workshop. If you have any questions along the way for our presenter, you can type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel, likely on the right-hand side of your screen. If you have any tech questions, you can also type them there. If you are interested in using live captions for today's workshop, you can use the link we will send in the chat shortly. If you are interested in receiving the recordings and materials from today's free webinar, you can visit our free webinars page on the Nonprofit Learning Lab website, or you can send us an email at program at nonprofitlearninglab.org. And without further ado, I will now hand it over to you, Rachel. Well, thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to be here with you this morning to share a step in program development that I'm particularly passionate about, and that is conducting feasibility studies. There are so many ideas out there about how to solve problems facing our communities, but many of those ideas never get implemented or don't get implemented in the right ways. In this webinar, we're going to put pen to paper and go through the questions that need to be asked before you launch a program to meet the needs of your community organization or clients in a way that's going to be sustainable and feasible and practical long term. Before we dive in, I'll tell you just a little bit about me. I am a soil scientist turned entrepreneur and founder. For as long as I can remember, I've never been able to let ideas die. Um, I've always been the one in a group that when we identify a problem, I am determined to find a way to solve it. So when I finished my PhD in soil science, I took a career leap um, to turn ideas into implementation as a nonprofit founder and now consultant. Today we're going to talk about the very first step you should take when you decide to move forward with an idea or potential solution um, before you raise money or recruit volunteers or design a new program, a feasibility study can be used to make sure your idea is viable. In this webinar, we will cover how to identify the questions that need to be asked in your feasibility study, um, how to collect data and market research, how to engage key stakeholders, and how to draw conclusions through the feasibility study and determine next steps. I was first exposed to the term feasibility study um, when a foundation I was working with on a proposal asked if I had a feasibility study to share about the program I was looking to fund. When I fumbled and responded no, they requested that we add conducting a feasibility study into our proposal, which was great. They gave us some funding for it. Um, but let me tell you a secret. I was sitting there with this funder and I had absolutely Rachel, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it looks like your screen and audio froze. Whatever problem. Rachel, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, your yeah. screen and audio froze. Would you be able to turn off your webcam to improve the audio? Sure. Thank you so much. Is that is that better? Yes, it is. I will let you know if we have any more issues. Okay, sorry about that. I was getting a notification over here that that was the case. So thanks for, for saying something. Thank you. So again, that uh, what a feasibility study is, is um, that second definition there, I think is maybe a little bit more practical for nonprofits, particularly is that a feasibility study is an assessment of the practicality of a project. Um, this is something that's used quite a bit in the business world for determining if a product or a concept is going to be profitable. Um, but in a nonprofit world, I think the practicality of, of a program and the likelihood of it succeeding are really what the feasibility study is trying to get at. So before we dive into sort of how you conduct a feasibility study, I am interested to know how, how familiar you are with feasibility studies. So is this the first time you've heard of them? Um, are you familiar with them but have never written one? Um, or do you have um, quite a bit of experience writing feasibility studies. 
I'm gonna leave this open here for a few minutes, or not a few minutes, sorry. I think like 30 seconds or so, give you a chance to respond. Great, so it looks like most people um, are familiar, but have never written a feasibility study, so that's perfect. Um, and then we also have some people who have never heard of them. I will say, um, you know, feasibility study, I, I don't know exactly how common the term is, but I also have used the term landscape analysis um, in conversations with some clients. Um, that also can be sort of a, a similar term to a feasibility study. So maybe you have some experience in doing that background research on a project, but haven't used this term or aren't familiar. Um, but I do think this is a fairly, fairly common term um, that's used when we're trying to think about the practicality of a project. Okay, great. So now we're going to walk through sort of what the steps are. And something that I didn't include a slide on, but you might be thinking to yourself, all right, as we go through this, this is a lot of work for one person to do. Um, and so if you are whether you are a consultant working with a client or if you are someone on staff at a nonprofit and you're thinking about how you're going to take the time to do a feasibility study, I think time can be a limiting factor in this background research. I would say that it, you know, it's potentially helpful early on to assemble a team of people who are going to sort of advise and guide the feasibility study process. Um, so don't think of this as daunting and something you have to do all on your own, unless of course you're a consultant and you might be getting you know, um, paid to do this work, but um, this is it definitely, I think, should be a thorough process in order to be done well. Um, and so um, be sure that you assemble a team at the beginning that can make sure that we, that when you're working on the feasibility study, that it can be done right. All right, so the first step in conducting a feasibility study is determining what questions you need to ask. And so I think that that can be from the big picture, sort of thinking about the market research, and then we'll also go into some logistical questions you might ask. Really though, you wanna think about how you can customize these questions for your particular program. So there's no standard format for a feasibility study, no particular questions you have to ask, but some things you might consider is, you know, framing the problem that you're trying to solve. If you're at a nonprofit, you likely are, you know, trying to create a project that's improving the community you work with or meeting a need of some sort. So what problem is that that you're trying to solve? Is this a problem that is widely acknowledged? You know, is this something that you think most people think is a problem or is this something that, you know, you really thought is a problem, but you don't know if for sure if other people think it's a problem or not? Who is that key audience? Who are the people who have this problem who you would be trying to, to help? Um, who else is trying to solve this problem and in what ways? So that could be other organizations in your community. That could be national organizations that do this at a big scale, but not, not specifically in your community, um, who could be potential partners. So you might want to think about, you know, who, who else is trying to work on this problem and how could you work with them? And then you, you're going to see this as a theme of, of the next few slides is that who are those key stakeholders who need to buy into the project in order for it to be successful? So as you're building that you know, team to guide the feasibility study, you should also be thinking about who are, the, who are the, the stakeholders, not only who are going to help develop the program, but who are going to need to support the program long-term in order for it to be successful. those questions at the beginning. Um, you might also think about the logistics of the program. This is also a really important thing to consider. So not only is this a program that's going to be meeting the needs of your community, but also how will your program be funded? How will it be funded, you know, initially with seed funding? Um, how will it be sustained with funding long term? What are the personnel needs going to be? Will they require additional staff at the organization? Will it be a volunteer-led program? How are you going to get that buy-in? Um, really important that you get buy-in from the stakeholders who, um, who need, need to use this program. Who are your partners going to be? You probably can't do this alone, so who will be your key partners? How will you communicate about the program? It doesn't do you any good to start a program and then um, not tell anybody about it. So it's important in the feasibility study stage to think about how you're going to get the word out to the people who need to use the services that you are 
proposing to provide. And then you can also at this stage um, think about questions related to the program details. How is the program going to be operated? Who is going to be the lead on it? Um, you know, how, how are you going to get your service to the people who need it? Um, those are also questions to be asked in the feasibility study stage. So once you've identified those key questions that you need to ask for your program, the next step would be starting to answer the question um, and looking through data and background information um, in order to, to start gathering, gathering that research. Um, so step two is to conduct a preliminary analysis. Um, this is probably going to be through online searches and working with the, the team that you already have who, who are knowledgeable of this issue. So at this stage, you would want to be looking at reports that have been done, analyses, memos. You may, you know, if you're based in Illinois, you may look at a similar program that's been developed in New York City. If you are, um, you know, looking to do something that has been done at the national scale or has been done at the state scale, but you're looking to scale that. Um, then you might want to look at um, some analyses or memos that go beyond just the scope of your community. Census and government data can be a helpful use resource at this point. Let's say that you are wanting to um, provide a service to unhoused individuals in your community. You may want to look at the census data for how many of those individuals exist or government data about how many exist in your community. Um, so, so that can be really useful at this point to know your target audience. This is also where you might do some research on potential partners. Um, you know, just a simple Google search and looking at, you know, who are the others who do that? You might already know those community partners in your community specifically, but you may not know some of those national partners or funders potentially who may be interested in funding your program. Um, so that preliminary analysis can find those partners. And this is a really great stage to start thinking about budgetary needs as well. What's it gonna cost both for startup of this program? Are there you know, pieces of equipment that you need or facilities that you need to get it started? Um, and then what are the long-term budgetary needs, whether that's staffing or um, operational support long-term? So your preliminary analysis should give you a good working understanding of the landscape of this, of this the problem that you're trying to solve and, and how your program might be able to solve that. The next step is to engage key stakeholders. No project is able to be successful without buy-in. Here's that, that term again, buy-in. Um, so then I would encourage you to actually spend more time at this engage key stakeholder stage than you would spend at the, the previous stage of obtaining background information because it's so important to be able to talk with this, the stakeholders who are going to support and utilize your program. Um, so take your questions. So again, we have this working set of questions for our feasibility study. And now you're going to take those questions out to the people that matter. So that could be civic and community leaders. Um, you know, They might be the ones who are going to publicly support the program and, and give it some, you know, a foundation uh, to, to build upon, work with community members or the people who are going to be benefited by your program. You want to make sure, you know, it's really, really important to make sure that if you're proposing to help a certain community, that that community thinks that you actually have a good solution and that you can help them in this way. Um, it's really important as well to engage funders at this point. So you want to talk with whether your funders are going to be foundations, um, if you're looking at government grants, if you're looking at grassroots support for this, um, maybe you're looking for um, support from a community of donors that already exist for your organization. Um, it's important to, you know, take these questions out to them at that point, too, and see what the viability is for receiving funding for this program, both at the beginning stages and long term. And then it's absolutely critical that the staff and volunteers who, are, who will be leading the program really have the opportunity to provide feedback at the early stages. Um, that you know, early stage input and feedback from, from those individuals is going to allow them to have more buy-in as they you know, start to, to work on the program. I know that 
the staff and volunteers are very busy people and you want to make sure that you are not um, asking them to do things that they find to be futile, that you really um, get their feedback early on so that way they are empowered and invested into the program that you're building. So then at that point, um, at this point, you've collected a lot of data, you've talked to a lot of people, and now it's time to pull it all together. Something that really caught me when I first um, did a feasibility study was I was looking for a, a format that I was supposed to be using. I had this funder who had asked for a feasibility study and I was you know, trolling the internet, trying to find you know, what a format of a feasibility study should look like and I could not find anything that fit. And then I realized that really your feasibility study should be focused on the purpose. It shouldn't be focused on some particular format. And so um, the purpose of your feasibility study is likely to you know, determine your viability, but also can you can think about a lot of different ways that your feasibility study can be used um, and that can drive what you, how you end up writing it. So um, you might consider outlining your background information and research at the beginning of the feasibility study. This can help provide some justification for, um, for why the feasibility study is being conducted in the first place, can provide some justification for the program that you are working to develop. You want, and then from there, the bulk of your feasibility study is likely going to be the questions that you identified at the beginning and then the answers to those questions. It doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. Um, you really want to be clear and, and, and answer those key questions. And then at the end of your feasibility study, you want to identify what those key findings were from the questions that you um, asked and then what that means for the project moving forward, which we'll talk about in a minute here. And then throughout this process, again, think about how this information might be repurposed. So for me, the first time I wrote a feasibility study, it was for a grant application. Um, I was able to then use that feasibility study for a grant report to that, um, to that funder. But then I was also able to pull information from that for future grant proposals. And there were a lot of pieces of information that I was able to pull and put on the website for my program. Um, so you might think about how those different sections, how the answers to your key questions and some of the background information um, can be used in other ways in the future as well. Um, you've put a lot of work into this at this point and you really wanna be able to show that um, or in your, pro your end product, you really want to be able to be um, a multi-purposeful document. So I wanna walk through an example of, of where I've worked the most on feasibility studies and just kind of walk through those four steps and how, how it's looked for me in the past. So the, the nonprofit organization that I founded was to support a state level science policy fellowship program in the state of Missouri. At the time when I was looking to start this program, um, there were two other similar programs, one in California and one in New Jersey. As you might imagine, the, the politics and structure of California and New Jersey are very different from the state of Missouri. And so um, we knew that it was going to be really important to think through how we designed our program and not just near what other states were doing. So, um, the goal of the program was to place um, scientists at the state capitol who could help answer scientific questions for lawmakers. And so the, the first question we wanted to ask was, well, do lawmakers actually want this resource? And if we put these scientists there, are they going to be a resource that's utilized? Um, you know, we don't just want to send these fellows to the capitol and then have nobody ask them questions. So that was the first step we, our first question we wanted to ask. We also wanted to ask how the program should be designed in order to best fit those needs. <laughs> we wanted to know how those fellows were going to be nonpartisan and make sure, excuse me, make sure that we avoided lobbying in the process, both for nonprofit <laughs> rules, but also because to be nonpartisan and trusted and seen as, you know, good brokers of information they couldn't be lobbying for a particular viewpoint and then the fourth question that we thought was really key was how are we going to fund this program long term fellows especially supporting full-time scientists in these roles is a lot of money 
um, for staffing. And we had initial foundation support, but we weren't sure um, how this program was going to be funded long term. And so we wanted to talk with potential foundations who might fund it. We wanted to talk with the state government and see if it would be something they would support long term, universities in the state, um, and make sure that this was going to be something that could be sustained into the future. So those were our four key questions that we asked. Um, we started off by collecting some background information um, about how other states have run their programs. We looked at um, some similar fellowship programs in Missouri for other disciplines to see how they um, ran their program. We did a lot of background information about how the state government works in Missouri and felt like we had a really good working knowledge of the situation so that we could go and engage with stakeholders and ask some really informed questions to uh, inform our feasibility study. Engaging stakeholders, I mentioned that that I think should be the most um, time intensive step in the feasibility study process. I was a PhD student at the time and I went around and walked the halls of the state capitol in Missouri and knocked on every single door to get feedback from lawmakers about how they what they would think of a program like this. We also talked to scientists across the state. We talked to universities across the state. I talked with funders, as I mentioned. And we really <laughs> found some good information in those conversations. And the program that we envisioned at the beginning of the feasibility study stage and the program that we ended up developing after having those conversations with key stakeholders looked really different, but it was really good like they were really good productive changes that we ended up making because of that engaging stakeholders process. And then we put this all together. And as I mentioned, <laughs> this was something that we used in um, a, a grant report because we were asked to develop it for a foundation. But we also then had um, these tools that we could use when we went to other foundations for support. Um, it gave us a really solid set of information for. Um, posting on our website and it was a really great resource for developing the program. And again, like I said, if we would have developed the program as we thought we were going to at the beginning, um, it probably would not have been successful. But because we went through this feasibility study process and gained so much good information, um, we ended up with a program that is now in the third cohort of fellows and is, you know, running really well. So that's, that's an example of how this feasibility study can be used. Once, once you get to the end of the feasibility study, um, we want this to be an actionable document. In this process, um, your, your goal is through a feasibility study is to determine if your project is viable or practical. But if you get to the end of this process and you think, wow, this is not really practical, well, you've also just collected a lot of data to potentially make this a practical idea. So what changes can you make to make it practical? So maybe, you know, you don't have to start from square one of a feasibility study next time, but you may need to, um, you know, go back and, you know, change some of your ideas, collect more information from stakeholders, do some more background research, but don't be too, um, you know, too discouraged if you get to the end and you don't think that your initial idea was was viable, because I think that you know, clearly you've shown passion at this point and um, you probably have some good information to make a viable program um, in moving forward. And then, yes, if your feasibility study, you know, if you determine that you have a really great idea that's going to be practical moving forward, um, your feasibility study can be used as a tool to start making a timeline and an action plan for what comes next. So some key takeaways. Um, so first, you have to ask the right questions to determine if your project will be viable. Really important that those are customized for your program or project. Next, um, it's important to collect data and engage with key stakeholders to answer your questions. And then finally, um, you're going to compile your findings and determine the next steps. So before I wrap up, I did just want to acknowledge um, and thank the Association of Consultants to Nonprofits. Um, I'm a member of that organization. We have a great partnership with Nonprofit Learning Lab. Um, that's why I was able to give this presentation today. Um, they have a request for proposal service um, and also a consultant directory. 
that I would encourage you all to check out if you are not familiar with them. And I would love to stay connected with all of you. Please don't hesitate to reach out. I have my email address listed here. Um, I'm also on Instagram and I have a weekly newsletter that you can subscribe to on my website. Um, and I think we have a few minutes for questions. And so I will go ahead and stop there and um, see if there are any questions. We do have one question. Lauren asks, will you please share the key differences between a feasibility study and a program needs assessment? That is a great question. Um, program needs assessment. I have not written a program needs assessment, so I'm not entirely sure what the format of that would look like. Like I mentioned, I think feasibility study sort of is a, a general term and it can you know, refer to a lot of different things. Um, program needs assessment, I'm not sure if that would just cover, you know, what what are the logistics? I don't know if it thinks about necessarily the big picture um, of, of the program. I know feasibility study really hopefully focuses on not just those logistics and the needs of the program, um, you know, like the, the funding and the staffing and the, um, you know, supplies, but also thinks about that big picture of how is this going to be received by the community? Who are going to be the long-term partners for the program? Um, and is that going to make for a long, a successful long-term program? Um, I think think that would be maybe my my answer, but I also I'm not super familiar with a program needs assessment. Great, thank you. Those are all of our questions at this time. Great, thanks. Thank you, Rachel. This workshop has now come to a close. If you are interested in receiving the recordings and materials from today's free webinar, you can visit our free webinars page on the Nonprofit Learning Lab website, or you can send us an email at program at nonprofitlearninglab.org. Thank you so much for participating. And again, thank you, Rachel, for educating our community.